Hey, friend, L. Steve here. And Larson. And welcome back to Going In Raw, the only pro wrestling podcast you need to be listening to right here at YouTube.com forward slash Stephen Larson. Yes, this is Matt Chad, and yes, it is going up on a Saturday instead of a Sunday. That is because this weekend, that's right, Sunday, May 26th, we will be doing our very first live podcast before a live studio audience in Las Vegas at the Tuscany Suites and Casinos. Uh, it should be a blast. 11 a.m. Uh, be there. Uh, completely free to everybody getting in. Uh, and if you happen to be at Starcast, uh, we're, we're there too. We'll also be at the collect in the collector's corner vendor area. Come say hi, buy a shirt, buy some merch, or just get a picture with us and come and say hi. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's why our, our schedule a little bit uh, off this week. No NXT 205 live or, or UK review. Although yes. I heard the the UK match between Walter and Pete Dunn was something else, but it had like a wonky finish. Yeah. So there's your review. There's your recap and review. Yeah. Walter, bad guy with uh, the European Union. There you go. They got a new name now, though. Oh, I didn't see. What's her name? I don't remember. (laughs) Oh, oh, it's uh, it's German, right? Imperium? Yeah, it's Imperium, I think. Imperium. Imperial. I don't know what it is. Something like that. Anyways. Anyway, this is Matt Chat. We're not here to talk about NXT UK or NXT or 205 Live unless... Unless... $20 $20 and up a month patrons ask us to, which I don't think anybody did. I don't recall seeing that, no. Nobody asked that, but they did ask a bunch of other questions. So let's get right to it, Larson. Who is first? First up, Andy Nero. We got a couple of uh, similarly theme question. One from Andy Nero, as you mentioned, one from Rich. We're running back to back, answer them together. Take it away, gentlemen. Hey, friendos. Hey, Stephen Larson. It's Andy Nero with another match up question. It's just gone 9 o'clock in the morning in Brexit time. I've not long been home from work. Um, and I haven't watched the pay-per-view, don't intend to. Uh, I've seen the results and it doesn't interest me. Uh, my question is in regards to the pay-per-view and more along the lines of casual fans. Oh, what is the point in Brock Lesnar? What does he bring to the product? Doesn't bring new eyes, doesn't bring big merch sales, he never performs particularly well. Might do a few suplexes, but that's about it. I wouldn't turn purple, of course, um, and do that for some reason. Um, yeah, what's the point? Why do you keep learning a new contract? And, uh, and yeah, what is the point in Brock Lesnar? Why do we have to keep being subjected to him? Too sweet. Hi, handshake. Take care. Bye. Randos Rich, the Smash Brother here. Hope you guys had an awesome time in Vegas. All in was yesterday. Yeah. Anyway. Why Brock Lesnar? Why... Again, what what does Vince possibly think is so damn special about a part-time idiot who doesn't respect anybody, who said he doesn't respect anybody, and this isn't even in kayfabe, and is just there to collect money and leave? Why does he continue to basically gamble his company and everything on someone who doesn't care about it? I don't get it. When will we finally see the end of Lesnar? I thought it was at the end of WrestleMania. I was excited as you guys were. And now not even two months or two months after WrestleMania, the turd is back in the toilet. So that being said, also, what do you guys think would have happened had it been McIntyre or Mustafa Ali that had won Money in the Bank if it wasn't for the turd having to show up yet again? Thank you, Andy Nero, and thank you, Rich. Thank you both. A lot, like of people are, first. a lot of people are very upset. Oh, they're they're concerned. Yeah, they're upset. A lot of people are upset. Yeah, about they are upset. The Brock Lesnar thing. I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest. This past Monday on Raw, Hot I take. was I was fairly entertained. I thought that they made a good case as to why Brock won the briefcase. Now, if now you know, I'm, I'm sort of holding my final judgment. Of course, see how all this plays out. If it just ends up with Brock cashing in in a boring fashion, come Saudi Arabia or something like that. Um, then, you know, I'll backtrack on that. But uh, I think the first week of Raw that we got after Brock's cash-in, um, I thought it was good. I think that through all fault of, of Vince McMahon and, and WWE, uh, they haven't properly built up um, a, a threat with that Money in the Bank briefcase, the likes of Brock Lesnar. I think that for whatever reason, they insist on Drew McIntyre being a henchman over and over again when he could have that spot if booked properly for oh, three yes. months. Oh, yes. Um, but I think that we saw something unique with Brock Lesnar and the Money in the Bank briefcase. Uh, usually they do that to, to sort of build up a new star, somebody who's already on the rise, and they put him over the edge. Um, with Brock Lesnar, it's a guy who 
you know, he, he's already been and done. He's done everything he can do. Vince keeps on going back to him as well. It proved out in the ratings. Um, they're trying a couple different things. Why Brock? Because Brock, in Vince McMahon's eyes, is money. Um, if the creative continues to be as as decent as I saw it this past Monday, I'm okay with it. I'm actually totally fine with it. Um, as long as you maintain Brock as this sort of, you know, omnipresent threat that could blow up at any moment. Um, he's the scariest money in the bank champ, uh, money in the bank winner we've had in a while. Yeah. I, I, so far I'm okay with it. All right. Uh, thing about Br- uh, Brock, he brings legitimacy to whatever he does. True. Um, given his pedigree as a collegiate wrestler, as a, a, a WB multi-time champion, and as a uh, UFC heavyweight champion. True. Um, he is one of the most decorated combat athletes um, in terms of what he's done in the octagon and in the ring. There is. He's no Minoru Suzuki, mind you, but he's up there. No, rare people are. Uh, oh, who? I mean, who compares Minoru Suzuki? Nobody, really. Um, greatest combat athlete of all time. Continue, please. Uh, anyways, can I just talk about Minoru Suzuki instead? No. Nobody asked about Minoru Suzuki. Well, they should. He's the best. Um, so I think that's really why what it comes down to is, is, is as you put it, Vince sees money in Brock, mm-hmm. whether it actually translates to butts and seats, uh, uh, merch sold, uh, pay-per-views bought, network subscriptions uh, bought, Obtained. any mm-hmm. of that, whether there's actually actual metrics to in, back in up. The short term, in the short term, one week, there was a boost. Yeah, there was a ratings boost. Um, but if that actually is A, sustainable, uh, uh, B, uh, something they could replicate um, uh, anytime Brock shows up. Um, and that all remains to be seen. Um, so, short answer, Vince th- Vince sees money in him. He sees money in him because he's legit. Uh, you know, a lot of us, myself included, uh, generally fairly bored whenever Brock shows up. He was relatively entertaining on Raw. Mm-hmm. This boombox briefcase stuff. That was, that was entertaining. He seemed like he was having a good he, if, time. When he's having fun, he's engaged. Uh, he could do some decent work. That's that's yeah. When he's bored, yeah. Then it's generally crap. Yeah. And that's just the issue. If he's if he's into it, then there's potential there to be some something worthwhile. Mm-hmm. If he's not, it's gonna it's it's, it's probably gonna be pretty shitty. Yeah. Um. But uh, I was gonna make another point, and then I forgot. Oh no. Oh, as far as the cash in goes, if he shows up on Raw this week and just says, uh, "I want Seth at uh Super Showdown," kind of underwhelming. Um, you know what? I had an idea last night. I didn't mention this during our SmackDown recap. That if uh, if he held that briefcase till October, maybe say October fourth, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when uh, SmackDown moves over to Fox. Oh yeah, and then cashes in there. Mm-hmm. That would be something. That might be a wise business move on WB's part. Let's see if they actually do it. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. I'd be surprised if they did though. Um, the answer to the second part of Rich's question: What would happen if Drew or Mustafa Ali won Money in the Bank? Um, I mean, like, I think fans like us would be into it. If someone like Drew won, you could still have – Drew doesn't have the fight pedigree that Brock has, obviously, but Drew is just about as legit as a professional wrestler as they come. There's there's an added level because here, here's the thing. Nobody in the wrestling community, no fan of the WWE, would really mind all that much if Drew – was champion. In fact, a lot of people would love it because we all know that the guy deserves it. Mm -hmm. And, and we love to see people who do good work, regardless of they're good guy or bad guy. We like to see those people get rewarded and that's how we feel the reward happens. Um, and it would take a new twist in, in the ongoing story. Um, but so the thing about Brock is that nobody really wants to see him be champion again. And so it adds an extra layer of, Dread, yes, because we're faced with the prospect of him hogging that title again and not being around, yeah. And that's a prospect that everybody's freaked out. So you have this additional level of being freaked out that this guy's going to cash in and totally win, and he's going to. It's the not bill. just he's going to cash in on one champion; is that he's going to try cash in on both, yeah, win both, and then be MIA for the most part mm-hmm. while holding both world titles, yeah. So that's all terrifying stuff. That is terrifying stuff. Um, whereas if, you know, Drew, it's not really that from a from a wrestling fan perspective, it's not that scary because the title would still be there. It'd be on a guy that we all love, Drew McIntyre. Yeah. 
and uh, it'd be great. And similarly with Mustafa, and, and you get the additional uh, bonus with Mustafa Ali, that he was slated for a pretty massive push mm -hmm. prior to getting hurt. Yeah. And, of course, that opportunity went to Kofi, and Kofi uh, took advantage of that opportunity, to say the least. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we'd all be super excited if either Drew or Mustafa Ali were to win. Um, didn't work out that way. So I guess we kind of have to just make the best of what we got. Pretty much, man. Yep. That's what you got to do in life. Uh, next, we got a question from a dinosaur. It's the raptor. He's oh, back. Oh, the raptor. Greetings, Steven Larson. The raptor is back. Another raptor question. Here's the question. So Kofi Kingston's the new Dean Ambrose. His first real contender is Dolph Ziggler? What is wrong with the WWE? They're awful. Have a fun time in Vegas, boys. Thank you, the Raptor. Thank you, the Raptor. Uh, every indication is that this feud with Dolph uh, is just kind of a stopgap measure. Uh, Kevin Owens reportedly does not want to go uh, to Saudi Arabia for Super Showdown. Yeah. Um, therefore, they can't continue that feud yeah. into that show. Yeah. Um, so they need an opponent for Kofi so he can defend the WB championship at Super Showdown if it's going to be as good, if not better, than WrestleMania. Um, well, it's, it says in the promo that it's guaranteed. Doesn't, don't they say guarantee or something Whatever. like that? Whatever. It's, it's the, phrase, <laughs> the phrasing is as good, if not better, than WrestleMania. So if you're going to achieve that, so one, weird. you'd have all the major titles. Hell, mm. well, you'd have most of the major titles defended. There's a couple, uh, three of them that aren't going to be defended there. Um, then uh, you got to have, I guess, quality opponents for those champions. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're going to get Seth and Brock for the Universal title. Mm -hmm. And so Dolph wasn't doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, he and Kofi have history. I think, I think and, also, I wonder if part of it is they match up well. What? I was still going. Oh, sorry. Anyways, fine. Go ahead. I think they match up well. I think they'll probably have a good match. Um, they could have gone maybe like Randy Orton or somebody that's sort of active on the roster. But he has a match against Triple H. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that match could have been against him. He could have tossed Triple H in that crappy Goldberg Taker match. Well, here's the thing. I wonder if uh, Saudi Sports Authority says, we really like ourselves the Evolution Feuds. They saw Triple H that and could, Batista that, at WrestleMania. That could be. Batista retired. We They want the next best thing. Yeah, which is guaranteed to be Randy as, Orton as good or better than WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, so I don't. There are other people on the active roster, but yeah, I just think that everything you just said, like you know, there's uh, other people either don't want to do it or they're Dolph ain't doing nothing. Busy. You plop them right in there. As soon as that match is over, back He's to the right comedy out. store. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Back to the comedy store with Dolph. <laughs> there you go. Or Laugh Factory, wherever he plies his, his trade as stand-up comedian punch in L.A. Punchline, punchline. Well, that's here locally. Anyways, next we've got a question there from... A, there's got to be a punchline. That's like a perfect club name. Yeah, that can't, that's got to be a franchise. Well, you roll the next question, yeah, yeah, and then let's, I'll look this let's, up. Let's hear, it from, uh, let's hear what Philly Flexer has to say. Hey, guys. This is your boy, Philly Flexer here. And uh, my match up question this week is, what can honestly get you to stop caring about a certain wrestler? Is it their booking? Is it... Just they're creative. Is they're how they're looking, or is it the, just their character? What is it that can honestly get somebody to stop caring about a wrestler? Uh, I mean, I like the fact that Dolph goes on breaks and stuff like that. Then comes back, it kind of gets me okay. Like okay, maybe we do something a little different with him. And I don't know. Maybe it's just because the quote unquote term is WWE has conditioned us not to care. I don't really know what that means or whatnot. But I don't know. What you guys say? We can get you to stop caring about somebody. All right. Be cool, man. Thank you, Philly Flexer. How is there no punchline? That's the Sacramento Institution, man. <laughs> I guess so. Woo! We got our own. We've got our own thing. Yeah. Anyways. It's just it's specific to Sacramento. Hooray. Yeah. Hooray for us. Uh, so, anyways, uh, what can make me stop caring about wrestling? A wrestler. A wrestler? Yeah. A wrestling guy? Yeah. Or gal? Yeah. It's, it's pretty simple. It's a one-dimensional character. Um, I like characters who have dimension to them. I think uh, if, if a character has a dimension to them, uh, they will be more apt to, to be more versatile in the types of stories you can tell. Uh, I'll give you an example of somebody who's a one-dimensional wrestler and why I didn't care about him. Um, should I go there? Yeah, I'll go there. Ryback. Right I just He was sort of a one-note thing. He was a very 
sort of one dimensional character. Feed me more. Did you ever really care about Ryback? Um, when he was on his Instagram story pulling up to a El Pollo Loco, I thought that Ryback was like kind of entertaining for a second, and then because he's sort of just ridiculous. But you're not going to get emotionally invested in that character ever. Whereas a guy like CM Punk, who is going to go up there and blur the line between reality and 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 between what's real and what's fake, mm-hmm. uh, and there's layers to his character. He's a straight edge guy. Uh, you know, he likes crazy chicks, uh, but by his own words, uh, I think you can do a lot with that. Daniel Bryan, you know, multifaceted, multi dimension character, regardless if he's a heel or face. Um, so yeah, I mean, Kevin Owens, even multi-dimensional characters, uh, that's, 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 what's going to keep me interested. That's why after all these years, I'm still interested in Daniel Bryan. I'm, I'd still be interested in CM Punk if he was around. Um, th- there you go. Even John Cena had some layers to his character beyond he had three. He had hustle, loyalty and respect. Yeah. There's three plus disability. Right <laughs> that's a superpower. Yeah. But that's part of his character. Well, what, what do you say? Um, I think you're almost there. Uh, there's a lot. I am there. F you. There's a lot. Um, I think if a wrestler has to constantly deal with crap creative, which doesn't showcase the full breadth of their abilities, it's real easy to to get invested in a character or a wrestler when they first debut or first re-debut, uh, have a repackaging or something. Mm-hmm. But unless there's they're, they're putting storylines that will constantly uh, give you a reason to invest in in the outcomes of their matches, it's real easy to grow indifferent. Um, also, kind of tied to that is if a, a particular wrestler doesn't really care to reinvent themselves. And I'm not talking, you know, wholesale changes from Matt Hardy V1 to broken Matt Hardy, um, or even anything as, as, as major as what we saw with Bray Wyatt or Chris Jericho, how he's constantly reinventing himself. And though, apart from the time when Chris Jericho came out in a suit and started talking real slow. Mm-hmm. Uh, every one of his reinventions isn't too far removed from the previous iteration. Yeah, no, he's not like changing vocational characters. No, no, sure, no, no. Yeah. It's just different aspects of the same character. Yeah, sure. Um, and so I think you've got to be constantly thinking about how you can evolve your character, whether it is whether it's uh, how you present them, how you dress, how you wrestle. Um, uh, without that, uh, it's real easy for a character or a wrestler to get stale. And uh, when that happens, then if a character or a wrestler gets kind of stale, then it's real easy to kind of grow disinterested. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think I do think that there are some there are some wrestlers out there who can be given crap creative and still remain compelling over a long period of mm-hmm. time. And I mean, they are few and far between. Yes. But uh, and sometimes it's an intangible thing. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's stuff that you just can't learn. You just you just you just have it. Um, and those are those are the very special ones. Yes. So yeah. Uh, next, we got a question from uh, new Matt Chatter, Chad. Chad. Howdy, friendos. The Chad here. First time Matt Chatter. Uh, so as we all seen at Money in the Bank, Charlotte, nine time women's champ. Um, my question is, do you think she'd have as much success if she wasn't Ric Flair's daughter, or do you think her success would have been the same? Cheers, guys. Too sweet. Hearty handshake. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chad. Um, I'm sure Charlotte being Ric Flair's daughter helped open a door for her. Absolutely, yeah. Um, But we've said this several times that regardless of her last name, if she couldn't deliver in the ring, her last name wouldn't have mattered. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, So, yeah, she she probably had some some advantage uh, being Ric Flair's daughter. However, you can't uh, say, well, her success is completely and totally tied to her being Ric Flair's daughter no, by a stretch of imagination. No. Gave her opportunity? Yeah, probably. Um, I'm sure. Like, but if she couldn't deliver, then she would not be given title match after title match. There, there, are after plenty of, there are plenty of examples of people who have a last name. Yeah, Bill name. Watts kid. Terrible wrestler. There you go. Eric Watts, I think his name was. He was given every opportunity to succeed. David San Martino. Yeah. Um... I mean, he's not the son, but he's the nephew of. Uh, What's the last name? Yeah. Terry Boulder. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, it's a horse Hogan, that is. Yes. Uh, so I mean, there are tons of people. It's I mean, it's it's so much more rare for somebody to uh, 
somebody succeed with that with that last with a last name mm-hmm. than it is for them not to. Um, if Charlotte Flair had somehow, some way, been separated from her family and raised in uh, the care of someone else, and still wanted to pro wrestle, uh, and she showed up at the performance center, however she got signed on, I mean, m- maybe some elements of maybe some elements that lend somebody to being a really good pro wrestler is in the genetics is in the blood. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you know, but if the, if the question is given who she is and what her bloodline is, if she didn't have the flair last name and nobody knew she was Ric Flair's daughter, would she have succeeded if given the opportunity? Absolutely. Of course. I mean, does her name help? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. I think it even helps you know, keep certain doors open because, you know, they, they like the lineage aspect of things. Yeah. Um, but I don't, there's no reason why she wouldn't have succeeded, yeah. I don't think. I yeah. mean, I mean, I think any pro wrestler are going to sink or swim based on how they, well they can perform in the ring. And I don't think there's any doubt. She's a terrific performer. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Anyway. Yes. Next. Who's next? Question from Cult of False Realities. Oh, he's talking about that 24-7 built. What's up, guys? Call to False Realities here. Back with another match chat question. And let's talk logic, guys. Something that seems like WWE doesn't have any time for. So, we have this 24-7 title, which is basically a revamp of the hardcore title. And we got this wild card rule that has just been going down. So, my question is, what is the most logical thing for WWE to do? Use this 24-7 title, put it on someone, and have them as a Crash Holly type where no matter what is is some type of hijinks going on, but he always retains. Or should they use the wild card rule for lower to mid card talent, you know, and have them promote themselves and actually rise up to be a main card type talent. You guys talk it out. Let me know. Too sweet. Hearty handshake. Thanks, guys. See you. Thank you, Cult to False Reality. Thank you very much. It's twenty four seven belt. That's one of the the ad- advantages of of that title is that it's a it's a showcase for what we somewhat jokingly call the loser locker room, but it's yeah. the it's the undercard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, especially now with wild card rule and main event performers dominating airtime, both Raw and SmackDown, you need something like this to keep the undercard involved. Even if it is just running after the champion for the grand total of like seven minutes during the course of Raw and SmackDown. Um, it's something to keep them involved, and it's one of the major advantages of the title, period. Uh, I don't. If the, whole, if the whole purpose of the wild card rule is to get marquee names on both Raw and SmackDown to keep the network satisfied, there's no way any mid carder on a consistent basis is going to be involved in, in going between shows. Or sorry, exclusively mid carters. Yeah, there you go. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, they needed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think. Uh, here, here's one thing that I hope the twenty four seven title might accomplish. Although, given the history of Vince McMahon and the WWE, I'm not optimistic about this. If the twenty four seven title could help expose one of the lower mid card guys. Um, could expose some new asset, some new facet of his character, some something that the crowd can really get hooked on. I'm thinking, and obviously this predates the 24/7 title, but Damian Sandow, you and I always thought he was mm-hmm. supremely underutilized. Mm-hmm. The crowd really got hooked into that totally, guy yeah. like two times, yeah, um, and they really didn't see more than that in yeah, him, no. which boggled my mind. Yeah. I, I know it confused you too. Yeah, it was really confusing. But if the 24-7 title would let, for example, I'm thinking of a guy like EC3, if the 24-7 title would allow him to showcase what he can do really well and can act as a vehicle to get the crowd on board so that Vince pays attention and uses him more and then maybe launches him into the proper mid-card or upper mid-card, then I think that's probably the perfect use for the 24-7 title beyond the obvious comedic entertaining aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and, and there will be on occasion, as we see now with Sami Zayn, uh, mid carters who uh, uh, are, are go between shows for the wild card rule. Whether the, the, their participation in that will lead to upward mobility in the card remains to be seen. But uh, I guess the potential is there, just not exclusively for mid carters. No. Yeah, 
Yeah, Sami Zayn was kind of an interesting thing because I mean, obviously he was fighting the world champion. Um, like I, I had kind of half a problem with Lacey Evans, like being there this past week on SmackDown when SmackDown has such a great women's locker room. You know, they have such a great women's division over mm-hmm. there. It's like you really you couldn't do somebody else. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They're still feeling their way out with this wild card rule. But yeah, you'd hate to think, man, with there's them signing so many people. There's so many people on their roster. Like, you know, I would hate the 24 seven thing to just be, oh, well, you know, you got to run around the arena this week. You should be totally happy. Yeah, I know. It's like on one hand, you know, I hope those guys are taking the most, uh, uh, the most advantage of that opportunity they get at the same time. Nobody wants to be stuck in the 24 seven division. Nope. You know? Nope. So there should be just like we said with 205 live and proved out, there should be some upward mobility. Totally. Totally. Ideally, that would be the case, yes. You want to go from the 205 Live to the 24-7 division. Yes. Yes, I know. Uh, next question from Christopher Rampersod. Hello, Stephen Larson. So my question is, who had the best match with all three members of the Shield? I mean, who had the best match out of all three members? I think it might have to be AJ or maybe John Cena. And I think the worst, it might be Brock or maybe Triple H. Because of the Roman match. But you guys decide. I'm going to write down a bunch of names who had matches with all three members of the Shield. And you guys figure out who's the best and worst. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Chris. Well, I stole your answer because it's the correct answer, Larson. They're both the correct answer. Seth Rollins versus C- John Cena versus Brock Lesnar. That Rumble 2014? Something like that. Man, yeah. it was spectacular. What a hell yeah. of a match. Uh-huh. That was a real a star-making performance for Seth. This is before he won... The championship, he cashed in money in the bank before all that. Rumble before that. Man, it was great. You're, so that's that's a great answer. You did take that answer. I will say this, though. It's also Seth Rollins, and it's in the gauntlet match from a year ago. Um, and that's like the entire roster had that match against him. So I'll go with that. All right. Uh, the worst is Brock versus Ambrose at WrestleMania. That match was awful. I would actually say the worst was Triple H versus Roman Reigns. Oh. When we rewatched that Brock-Ambrose match... Yes, everything we said about it was true, except there were some fun things about it. I'll raise you this then. <laughs> Jericho Ambrose in that ah! asylum match. Oh, no. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I can't think of like a stinker worse than that. I, I'll, I'd i have to go back, and I don't want to. Boy, yeah. that was a bad match. Another uh Contender for best match would be the Shield versus uh, Wyatt Family mm-hmm. in the sure. chamber, that tag match. Yeah, yeah. If we're strictly going with solo guys, though, it's yeah. Seth versus this, Seth versus that, Seth versus this, Seth yeah, versus that. All, uh, Seth. Ambrose Triple H at Roadblock was, was a good really match. good, too. That was a good match. Ambrose really has had good. a couple of good matches. We just sort of forget them because he's had a lot of like mediocre matches. And then too. a couple stinkers. Mm-hmm. Uh, next, got an interesting question from Thayer Thabata. Thayer Thabata. Let's see what he has to say. If Undisputed Era received booking of comparable quality to the New Day on main roster, which team will go down in history as the better faction? Steve, you get New Day, and Larson, you get Undisputed Era. And also, a quick side note, if you guys are looking for some reading material on your way to Vegas, I'll leave the link to my script in the email. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thayer Thabata. Thank you, Thayer Thabata. You can go first. Okay. What's his question? With comparable booking, which team would go down as better New Day? Oh, the New Day. They've proven it. They have such a remarkable chemistry, which so does the Undisputed Era. Well, they have Big E. They have Big E. I mean, come on. It's Big E. He's tops amongst all those. And as much as I love Adam Cole, as much as I love Adam Cole, they have Big E. The New Day complement each other so perfectly and i get the feeling that the undisputed era while i love them they're a tag team and a world champion and a mid carter which is a proper uh, equation for a for a faction but those usually never really last whereas the new day there's they're all a tag team they're they could all be singles guys they could all be main eventers they could all be main eventers yeah they have a world champion right now yeah but they all could be yeah so they have like they're so unique. Yeah, you know, I've never seen a faction stay together this long, be this popular for this amount of time. Yeah, besides maybe the Freebirds. Yeah, but yeah. even those guys, there was one main eventer and two other guys. Well, I mean that was more so towards the was the, Terry Gordy a main eventer in I think WCCW? He I think he was in Japan though. Was he? Yeah, yeah I think he was. What a about a singles wrestler in Japan? Buddy, Buddy Roberts, Roberts. Mm-mm. Yeah, but I mean, like in their early days, 
their their arguably more popular days, they were a tag team. Yeah, they were a faction. They didn't really wrestle consistently singles. It wasn't until uh, like the second run with Jimmy Garvin mm-hmm. that Michael P. S. Hayes mm-hmm. uh, got some singles gold. I was totally tongue in cheek when I said he's oh. a main eventer. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not. <laughs> no, he's. I think he's not. a U.S. champion. Doesn't in my US heart, champion. he is. In my heart, he totally doot, is. Doot doot doot. Up on the rock stage, he is. Did you ever hear? Listen to the Pritchard podcast about Michael P. S. Hayes. No, but after the fact, he was talking about Michael Hayes. I think in the intro to like the next episode, they were talking about the response to the Michael Hayes mm-hmm. one, and he said, doot, doot, doot. Doot, I don't remember doot, what you doot. told me. Yeah, it's an interesting listen. Um, yeah, it's hard to make the case for Undisputed Era for the same reasons you, you laid out. Uh, New Day, their chemistry is so singular, mm-hmm. so unique. Um, well, you can talk, talk up the Undisputed Era. That's I mean, fine. They're great, but I mean, I think what really tra- what sets what sets New Day apart is, is what we just mentioned, is that the versatility is, is off the charts. They don't have a serial killer, though, which the Undisputed Era might have on their hands yeah, with Roderick, Roderick Strong. Strong. That's true. It depends on how many more bloody pieces of clothing Roderick Strong presents to Adam Cole. True. Um, Undisputed Era is great, but there's a, there, there seems to be a more strict delineation between the roles. I know, granted, when they uh, won the Dusty Classic, that wasn't necessarily the case. But uh, uh, it's very clear at this point, Adam Cole is the guy that's going after the world title. Mm-hmm, sure. Uh, Redragon mm-hmm. is, is, in theory at least... The, the two guys going after the tag titles, and Roderick Strong should be the guy going after the mid-card title. Do we know the nature of Bobby Fish's uh, injury? Uh, I think Melser said he just took a shot to the head, but it wasn't serious. I know he came out with a sling. Yeah, right, yeah. But he didn't say anything about an okay. arm injury. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Undisputed Era is, seems more like a, a faction in the traditional sense, mm-hmm. whereas I feel like the New Day, they're, they're, they're kind of like a, 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 a newer hybrid faction where there's no le- no clearly defined roles for anybody. It's kind of interesting they haven't tried to use that same template the WWE given how successful they've been. It just developed organically with the yeah. new day, you know. Yeah. I think it's just, I think that's part of it. Well, I mean, you could take, well, that wouldn't really work. I mean, it with 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 a lot of finagling with a, a certain amount of time and role changes AJ in the club. Mm-hmm. Carl Anderson, by all accounts, is a terrific singles yeah. wrestler. Yeah, Luke Gallows probably could be too. I mean, his nature—he's sort of a, like a modern day Nash. You know, he's yeah, just a yeah, big, yeah, tall yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, it's very rare you get a, a faction where everybody is on equal footing across the board in, in skill set. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and like New Day, they're all amazingly charismatic. Mm-hmm. They're all really good promo guys. Yeah, they're all really good in the ring. Um, they all individually check off every box pretty much you want for a main event wrestler. Mm-hmm. And that just doesn't happen very often. Yeah. I mean, as much as I love Roderick Strong, he's not that great of a promo. No, he's not. No. Um, Neither is Bobby Fish. Yeah. I mean, it, it, Adam Cole is, is in terms of skill set, probably the standout in Undisputed Era. Yeah. You know, he's a great promo. He's been putting on really good matches of late. Um, and, and Kyle O'Reilly's great. Mm-hmm. I love him. He's a good promo. He's a good wrestler. He's probably closest to Adam Cole in terms of skill set. Oh, I don't know. I think in terms of in terms of in ring ability, no, just overall, overall including overall. promos. Yeah. You're probably right about that. You're probably right about that. Um, next, we got a question from Loki. Oh, cool. Hello, Stephen Larson. Loki Richard here with this week's Matt Chat question. A few weeks ago, you mentioned Kenta in one of your reviews, which got me thinking. Do you think he considers his time in WWE a success? The question is. What do you think a successful wrestling career is? Take Kenta, for example. He spent five years in the company. He was in TakeOver once, spent most of his time injured, and I don't think he ever appeared in the main roster pay-per-views. So, with that in mind, I at least know who he is. So for me, I guess it could could be considered a success, but what do you think a success is? Have fun with the debate. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Loki. Thank you, Loki. Uh, I doubt Hideo Tommy Kenta would say that he was uh, content or happy or considered his time in WWE success, um, even just from the standpoint of being injured a lot. Yeah, sure. Um, it's hard to gain momentum and, and, and develop any sort of push when it's constantly being interrupted by injury. From that reason, if no other, he'd probably say, yep, my run in WWE, not a success. Um, take the injuries out of the equation. 
which is hard to do with him because it was it, his, his it time to be he his is time, kind of yeah. defined by his injury issue. It killed his NXT run, mm-hmm. and then yeah, and would and that landed him into a two five live. So um, I'm guessing the reason he left after his release is because he wasn't enjoying his time in WWE. Yeah, you would think whether so. it was the, you know the constant injuries, whether it was the lack of vision, direction for his character, whatever the case may be, he probably just said, "All right, not into this. Isn't fun." Probably right. Regardless of the money he was making, I don't know if it was good or bad. I don't know. He kind of got signed on the NXT before we started hearing about them handing out larger contracts. Yeah, I wonder what Finn was making. Because he came in at the same time as Mm -hmm. the day with Tommy. I wonder Mm -hmm. what Finn was making on his first contract. Um, So the second part of Loki's question is, what makes a successful career? Uh, I I think a lot of it is just the personal satisfaction you get out of uh, doing that for a living. And that can cast a wide net. Whether you're in it strictly for the payday which I'm assuming many wrestlers are because they can make good money doing it. Um, you're in it for the accolades, the fame, the notoriety that can be gained from being very successful in it. What, however you de- derive personal satisfaction from your job, in this case professional wrestling, I think that's really how you define a successful career. Because while, say someone like Dolph, um, you know, he's never been the guy. Yeah, He's made a handsome living. Um, he's had his fair share of accolades and titles. Um, and I, he, and while, you know, he, in some respects might have over, overstayed his welcome a bit. I, if, if you ask most professional wrestlers, would you like a career like Dolph Ziggler? I'm sure a lot of them would say, hell yes. I would think every single one of them would say, hell yes. Are you kidding me? He makes like a million and a half a year or whatever. For, to basically <laughs> not work. And he's held every, like every title. Yeah. Is. He's, so, he's, yeah. A, he's a grand slam champion. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's, I think it's, <laughs> I have my answer written down as money and gold Um, because I mean, that's, you know, we've heard this many, many times from wrestlers. I mean, there's, there's the guy like, you know, there's guys like Scott Hall who said he was never a mark for championships, um, but he was, you know, he always wanted money because who doesn't want that? Yeah. Um, I think so many more wrestlers out there. I kind of think that that, that seems like it's, it's the exception. I think a lot of people sort of think that, and it's hard to argue with this when they give you, when they book you to win a championship title, that's a sign that they have trust in you to carry the brand and to represent the brand and make a lot of money. And you can do that. Um, so I would find it hard pressed to think that that, you know, wouldn't be considered uh, success in the in the pro wrestling uh, business. That, mm-hmm. That's what I would think. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Uh, next, Stephen M. What's going on, friendos? Um, what's the best venue outside the wrestling ring to have a match? I personally work in a hospital, so I think that'd be hilarious watching people wrestle there. And with the introduction of the new twenty four seven title, um, I feel like we're going to get a lot more outdoor and random matches. So. Rank, power rank, the top 10 best places to have a match outside the ring. Too sweet. Howdy, handshake. Thank you, Stephen M. Thank you, Stephen M. Uh, parking lot. Give me a parking lot. Oh, Heck yeah, man. crazy, man. Backyard. Uh-uh. Backyard wrestling. Pfft, never heard of a promotion called parking lot wrestling. What are you? Give me backyard wrestling. That's what I want to see. Blood. Fluorescent tubes. Giant bolts stuck in people's brains. Amateurs who have just watched a little bit of wrestling on TV. And now they I want professionals. No, man. Now they think they can do it for reals, and they're just stabbing each other with stuff. Terrible. It's horrible. Awful. How is it more people don't die doing that stuff? I don't know. Just in general. That guy, the they board. had the giant bolt stuck in his head. Oh, no, he didn't suffer any sort of serious brain injury. That thing was massive. They couldn't get it out, and they were getting some pliers trying to pull it out of his head. Go let's see a medical professional. That was horrifying. Could do some serious damage. Like, that really messed me up. I really, I saw that, and I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, no, they're just in backyard wrestling. Give me a parking lot. I want to see professionals wrestling in a parking lot. <laughs> you got cars out there you can slam people into. Put them through the windshield, slam them into the windshield. Why top don't you of the take cars. it up another notch? Highway. Because there's moving vehicles. That's yeah. death. I don't want to deal. I don't want to see anybody die during the course of a wrestling match. No way. Probably right. Um, and then you get like cones. There could be other things in the parking lot. Weapons you can use. Uh, give me that. Give me a parking lot. Well, I see. I I want to go the way of DDT Pro and either some sort of go kart facility, or uh, like a pond or an office. Like with cubicles, yeah, some sort of campground, a mall, <laughs> right? A baseball stadium. But no, give me, give me back. Yeah, no, a parking man. lot, please. Uh, next question from uh, Jacksonville's number one, Gian Halili. 
What's going on, friendos? This is Jackson Blaze, number one Matt Chatter, Gianco Leon. I'm at the gym, getting jacked. Uh, yeah, I've got another Matt Chat question. So I felt very negative towards the end of last week's Matt Chat question, and I want to bring it back to being positive, just like the friendo community is. So, my question for this week is, who wins an eight-man tag team match? Participants, Ricky and Elliot of Internet Today, teaming up with Steven Larson of Steven Larson's Going in Raw against Bruce, Adam, James, and Lawrence of Funhouse. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Yeah, I can't wait to hear this one. Too sweet, guys. Bye. Thank you, Guion. Thank you, Guion. Go ahead. You can go first. All right, I'll go first on this question where he asks, oh, pff, give me a break. This is a squash match. Going in Raw versus and Internet Today versus Funhouse. I don't know. Some of those dudes are kind of jacked over there at Funhouse. I know. James is jacked. But they're also like really good guys. They'd be the baby faces. They're all good guys. And uh, and we're like uh, old grizzled bastards. So I feel like we'd win because, uh, number one, we don't have like a big rooster teeth backing us. So they're safe and comfy. Whereas we're like independent, same as internet today, just getting by on the Patreon scraps. So we're scrappy, we're hungry, we go over. Sounds like we're the baby faces in that respect. It'd be like it'd be like fun house, like a bunch of nice clean people versus bum fights. <laughs> All right. That's, That's what I'm thinking. We're bum fights. I like putting my friends over. Um, so I got a way that everybody goes over uh, except us. We look like cowards, basically. No way, man. Or, or, and uh, so the match begins. Uh, for whatever reason, we can't get taken out of the match. Uh whether it's like power bomb through table, what the heck, something like that. So for vast duration of the match, Funhouse dominates. Um, Don't like because they have strength in numbers. We're laid out. Um, at a certain point, we come to, and rather than really bring the fight, just low blow, low blow, low blow, low blow. Okay. Ricky and Ellie get the advantage. They get the win. Everybody looks good. Oh man. God, you're like the freaking, you're such a cuck. What's your problem? I'm protecting everybody. You just cucked us out. I protected everybody. You are a beta lord. I'm protecting everybody. Everybody goes you're over. You're not protecting us? I don't care about protecting us. Oh, you're crazy. I want my friends to look good. No, we win in a squash match. No End way. End of story. No, I want my friends to go to, 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 to get the spotlight, oh, not me. Goodness gracious. Let's just move on. All right. We agree got, to disagree on that okay, one. So we got one last question, and it's a text question from Luis Ariza. He asked what the ceiling is for the 24-7 championship. He wants it to be like the DDT Pro Ironman Heavy Metalweight Championship. Yeah. I think you agree. It would yeah. be great if that were the ceiling. I don't trust WWE to do that. I feel like what we're getting now with our truth is kind of how as good as it's going to get. Oh, I don't know, man. We're not going to see like full-on matches in the mall. We're not going to see anything in, like in the office building. We're not going to see anything that interesting on a consistent basis. Well, none of no that way. stuff was for the Heavy Metalweight. The heavy metal weight was one that was like going down on Twitter and shit. And I know like, people were thumb the, wrestling for it. I know. Yeah, that's that's what I want to see, and they can totally do that. Take advantage of. It. Now I'm kind of with you. I don't think they're gonna do that, but uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun. And I, my hope is that is the ceiling. Uh, will it happen? Uh, probably not. I feel like we're, what we're getting right now is probably as good as it's gonna get. Uh, I have hope. I have hope that they can do some fun stuff with it. Once Vince McMahon forgets it's around. Then those clever kids, the 37 people on the writing staff who have seen DDT Pro, oh, yeah. They'll be getting what away with some What percentage of WWE shenanigans. writers do you think are actually aware of DDT Pro? 100%. I think, they, I think they're all pretty savvy. Dave Schilling knows what DDT Pro is. He spent a cup of coffee in the WWE. But if he's the guy, if he's the type of guy they're bringing in, pff, absolutely. I don't know. I don't know. They all do. Anyways, that's it. That's it for the show today. Well, that's it, really? Yeah, I've been a little short. Uh, anyways, uh, again, if you're in uh, Las Vegas... This weekend, please come on by. Uh, Sunday, May 26, 11 a.m., Tuscany Casino and Suites. Mm -hmm. uh, our first ever live show in front of a live studio audience. Um, it should be a lot of fun. We're doing our, our uh, Double or Nothing review. Um, come on by and, uh, and join us, please. Yes, please. Till next time, we'll talk to you later. Bye.